Uh, good morning, folks. If you're just joining us, uh, happy Tuesday. It's a beautiful, gorgeous day this morning. We're going to wait maybe just a couple more minutes to get uh, to let others uh, join as well. And then we're going to start at uh, 8.01 in the morning. Good morning, folks. Again, if you're just joining us, we're going to wait just a couple more minutes so others can join us as well. And then we are going to start the uh, panel discussion this morning. Good morning, folks. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're going to wait just one more minute and then we will start. Good morning, everybody. It's 8.01 in the morning. I think we're going to start. Uh, thank you again for joining us this beautiful Tuesday morning. My name is Luigi Del Puerto. I'm the managing editor of Colorado Politics. As you know, state policymakers have identified soaring criminality in the state as a key challenge that they vowed to tackle this year. Some, of course, blame the state's criminal-friendly policies as contributing to the trend, while others say that the lock-up-everybody mentality has a longer record of failing communities. Again, thank you for um, joining us this morning. We have a great panel, but before then, I want to introduce to you Chris Reen. Chris Reen, of course, is the CEO and president of Clarity Media Group, the parent company of Colorado Politics and the Denver Gazette, which are presenting today's program. Uh, Mr. Reen is also the president and publisher of the Colorado Springs Gazette. Chris? Thank you, Luigi, and good morning, everyone. And thank you again to our panelists for agreeing to be a part of this very timely conversation. We really appreciate your engagement today. On behalf of the Denver Gazette and Colorado Politics, we are pleased to host this very important conversation about crime and the potential solutions that are being discussed. As you know, our state leaders have identified soaring crime as one of the most pressing challenges we face today. We launched Colorado Conversations to offer a platform to discuss this and other challenging topics. In the coming months, we'll host several more forums to talk about the biggest public policy issues confronting Colorado. We at the Denver Gazette and Colorado Politics want to contribute to the conversation and hope that this discussion will provide our listeners and viewers and readers with new information and insight. So thank you all for being here today. Moderating this morning's discussion is Luigi Del Puerto, who you've already met, a veteran journalist and managing editor of Colorado Politics, the state's biggest and most dedicated source of political, legal, and public policy news. Luigi joined us recently from Arizona, where he served as publisher and editor of the Arizona Capital Times. He's a native of the Philippines, 
where he covered national security and wrote about corruption in government. Luigi, take it away. Chris, thank you for that very kind introduction. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a great panel this morning. Uh, joining us is Dr. Lisa Pasco, who is the chair and associate professor of sociology and criminology and affiliated faculty in gender and women's studies program at the University of Denver. In addition to numerous articles, book chapters, and technical reports, she is the co-author of The Female Offender, Girls, Women, and Crime and Latinas in the Criminal Justice System, Victims, Targets, and Offenders. She teaches numerous courses, including Murder in America, Criminology, and Drugs in Society. Professor Pasco is currently examining the challenges and successes of problem-solving courts during the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Pasco, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Also joining us this morning is Lisa Ravel, who's the executive director of the Harm Reduction Action Center, a public health agency that works with people who inject drugs. She has been with the group since 2009. She, uh, Ms. Ravel grew up in, outside of Chicago, Illinois, and graduated from DePaul University with a degree in communications and a minor in women's studies. Her activism was cultivated with her experiences as an overnight homeless shelter coordinator, development work at a domestic violence agency, uh, a former campaign manager for the California County Supervisor, and an AmeriCorps VISTA at an AIDS agency. She is also the secretary of the board of directors of the Colorado Criminal Justice Reform Coalition. In 2014, she won the Colorado Public Health Association Award for Excellence in Policy, and in 2018, won the Recovery Ally of the Year Award from Advocates for Recovery Colorado. Lisa, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Also joining us this morning is Mitch Morrissey, who is a fellow of the Common Sense Institute. He has served the citizens of Denver for 33 years as a career prosecutor, including three terms as the elected district attorney. As a DA, uh, Mitch aggressively prosecuted criminals and advocated for crime prevention and intervention initiatives, such as drug court and juvenile diversion. He is internationally known for his expertise in DNA technology. He spearheaded the Denver Cold Case Project, which uh, reviewed over 4,200 unsolved sexual assault and murder cases using DNA technologies. He has also developed the Justice Review Project, which is called Colorado's first prosecutor-led lead, prosecutor DNA exoneration program. After leaving the Denver District Attorney's Office in 2017, uh, Mr. Morrissey co-founded a forensic DNA software company that is a leader in using investigative genetic genealogy to solve cold case rapes and murders from as far back as 1963. As I mentioned, uh, Mitch is a fellow with the Colorado Common Sense Institute. Mr. Morrissey, thank you for joining us. Good morning. Um, and um, also joining us this morning is uh, Chief Paul Payson, who was appointed, appointed the Denver Chief of Police in July of 2018. Uh, Chief Pazin has served the Department of Residence of Denver since 1995. He has overseen the creation or expansion of innovative programs with a public health focus, including the Domestic Violence Prevention Program, the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program, Mental Health Clinician Co-Responders Program, and several others. Um, Chief Pazin, as I mentioned, served for 12 years as a command level officer, including six years as commander of District 1, where he led an ambitious effort to enhance police services through collaboration and innovation. During his 25 year Denver police career, he received numerous department awards and commendations, including the Dis Distinguished Service Cross, the Leadership Award, the Superior Tactics and Response Award, Police Merit and Department Service Award. Chief Pazin also served in the United States Marine Corps and is a Gulf War veteran. Chief Pazin, thank you for joining us this morning. Honored to be here, thanks. As I mentioned, uh, storing crime has been identified by our state leaders as a challenge that they vowed to tackle this year. Here are some facts. Data compiled by the Colorado Bureau of Investigation show that the following spike, they showed the following spike in crime from 2019 to 2021, 20% 20 total <coughs> increase in property crime, 86% increase in motor vehicle theft, 48% increase in commercial burglary. Violent crime, according to the data, rose by 17%. Murder by 17, 47%, aggravated assault by 31%. A bit of good news. Uh, sexual assaults dropped by 6%. Uh, this data have been uh, confirmed and corroborated, of course, by several other agencies, including the Colorado State Patrol, which, uh, according to its 2021 auto, auto theft data, um, uh, show that uh, their data show an increase of 88% in motor vehicle thefts since. 2017, and an 82% increase just since 2019. 
Um, I guess I'll start with that. Uh, Chief Payson, I want to begin with you, sir. What is causing to your mind these spikes in crime that we're seeing in the state? Luigi, uh, I think this is the, the question that we all want to, to get to. We all, all want answers in this. Uh, and then I think uh, as, as human beings, we all want to point to one thing and say, it's this bill, it's this legislation, it's this action. Uh, what I would propose is that this is a layered approach, that there's a compounding uh, factor that does, uh, from, from my perspective, as somebody that has studied Denver crime for 27 years, um, I do see challenges with uh, some of the state legislation that is making it more difficult to address repeat and violent offenders. So I'm not gonna to point to one specific bill, but I will say that uh, we saw increases in 2014 uh, with auto theft in particular. And there was also the timing of a bill uh, that really focused on auto theft that decategorized uh, F4s to F5s for expensive cars and F4s to f sixes on inexpensive cars. And then the net result of that was dramatic increases in auto theft, uh, specifically compared to the national average. We used to be at or below the national average uh, dating back uh, 2008 through 2014. And then uh, there was something ha that happened. And since then, now Colorado is the single worst state in the country for auto theft. I think that uh, there are layered or compounding issues that are contributing to that factor. And I believe that uh, really part of the solution is to look back, uh, study uh, what has occurred. I think that this is a weakness that we have uh, as a state is uh, legislation will pass and then there's not a mechanism to study the effects of that. Uh, did the uh, desired impact occur or not? Are there unintended consequences? And when we're talking about auto theft, uh, this is, let, let me also clarify, uh, this is not a Denver problem. Uh, this is a statewide problem. We saw a huge 138% increase in auto theft uh, over those last uh, two years but so did the uh, rest of the metro area, Arapahoe, Jefferson, Douglas County saw uh, dramatic increases across the state uh, in smaller counties as well. And uh, we absolutely need to take a look back and see what uh, is impacting this issue. Uh, thank you for that, Chief Payson. I wanna uh, bring in Dr. Pasco. Dr. Pasco, ma'am, you're looking at these numbers, you're looking at this data, you're looking at these statistics. I'm wondering what goes through your mind. I guess the same question to you, uh, you know, based on your work from what you're seeing, um, what do you think is driving these, uh, uh, you know, large significant increases in, 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 in crime? Well, there's a couple of things that I like to look at when understanding a crime problem. And sorry, I seem to be freezing up, so I'm sorry for that. But, um, you know, one of the things is to put it in perspective as to what might be normal for Colorado. And I'm not suggesting that 2020, 2021 and going into 22 and 23 are normal for us or things that we should just live with. I'm not suggesting that. But when I look at crime rates over Colorado for, let's say, the last 35 years, what I see is that a lot of times we should expect crime rates to fluctuate. Indeed, that should be the case. And how, when we look at those fluctuations, do they sort of match what we're seeing nationally? And when we go back that far, we see that while we're below national averages a lot of the times, our fluctuations often mirror what's happening nationally, which means maybe what's going on in Colorado isn't so exceptional. The other thing that I'd like to point out is that 2012 to 2014 were really low crime rates across the country, but for Colorado. And while that might be a goal to shoot for, we shouldn't treat those years as though that's what we've always experienced. That's indeed not true. And if we stop at the moment of the pandemic, which basically left us stranded in many ways, we look and we can see that crime rates started to tick back up. We, Assuming that crime rates do ebb and flow, we would expect some of that regardless of whatever legal changes were happening. And in 2019, we had some indicators that it might have been down in a downward trend anyway. And even in the beginning of 2020, there were some indicators that we, we would have been going down. However, what happened is 
yes, the pandemic hit us. And then what happens is when we're left stranded, our institutions, whether they're the ones that are our work, our play, our religion, our school, they no longer stabilized and supervised us. And we did have an influx of people that, you know, of, of kind of like motivated offenders. We had people that were 100% increase in housing insecurity. We saw a dramatic increase in substance misuse and abuse. We saw, um, you know, basically economic turmoil. We had a lot of these sort of situations produce a kind of perfect storm that we could predict then we're going to increase crime. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't look at that, right? Like, we shouldn't just say, well, that happened and we are gonna deal with it, we have to be responsive. But in the sort of history of looking at these crime rates, whenever we've had these legal changes, and in the 1980s, we did the same sort of thing, only in a punitive direction. And we didn't see it really affecting crime rates much. So I, I agree with Chief in that this is a multi-layered approach and that we have to look at all the factors that might matter, but we need to look at them together in order to really understand what drives crime rates up and down. And right now we do have a lot of kind of crime adjacent social problems that were highly amplified and created not just motivated offenders, but way increased opportunity during the pandemic. I also just wanna say that when it comes to car theft, which is really a concerning increase for Colorado, that a lot of our neighbors are experiencing really big increases too. So we can go to Billings, Montana or Johnson County, Kansas or the Quad Cities in Iowa. We can go down to Tulsa, Oklahoma and talk with all of our neighbors because they're also experiencing this big increase in auto theft. A lot of it has to do around catalytic converters and a lack of consumer confidence and supply chain issues, but we're not really that alone in this. I mean, our percentage increases are concerning, but we, you know, we are experiencing patterns that other people in other places, regardless of politics and regardless of legal changes, are also experiencing. And we're going to flesh out those details, but what I'm hearing from you is that we're necessarily not an outlier compared to other states. And the second thing is we're looking at 2010 and 2014, that's a really low base for crime rate compared to what's happening uh, to the rest of the country in those years. Um, let me go to Mitch. Mitch, uh, sorry, the same question to you. You've heard what, what uh, Chief Payson said and what Dr. Pasco said. What, what are your thoughts or what do you think is driving these numbers? Well, in the, the Common Sense Institute study that we did on crime, we didn't go back 30 years. We went back 10 years. One of the questions we wanted to know was, what did the pandemic cause this crime wave? And uh, we, so we looked at trends that went back to, say, 2011 and things that that went on from then on and looked at those rates. And, you know, Colorado in that period of time, not only is number one in auto thefts, but it's also number one in the increase in property crimes. And I think that for a long time in Colorado, back to when I was the DA in Denver, uh, this idea that property crimes really don't matter. Uh, you know, what we should be focused on are violent crimes, sexual assaults, kidnappings, homicides. Now, unfortunately, we're seeing an increase in the homicide rate and the assault rates also. Uh, but kind of like, well, you know, it's only a property crime. And I don't think that uh, when you look at, you know, you, you said I'm a DNA guy. I've been studying DNA for a long time. You look at a state like New York, when they started to take DNA on misdemeanor convictions, they started to see the connection between low level property crimes and homicides, low level property crimes like you know, jumping a turnstile at the at this uh, subway and rapes. So they started to take DNA from people that were being convicted of those low level property crimes. And they realized these are the guys we've been looking for for these rapes and murders. And so I think that the connection that you can draw there is that you have hopefully a very small population in your community that don't pay attention to any of these crimes, be they misdemeanors, be they felonies, and they are committing some of the most violent offenses. I think the chief is right. You need to focus on repeat offenders. You need to focus on violent offenders. And we need to kind of re-gauge and go back and look at what is the impact of 
what we did around parole five years ago? What is the impact of the laws that were passed around uh, issuing PR bonds or issuing bonds, those types of things? I'm not saying you change those things. I'm just saying, what is the impact of those things? There is something impacting this. You know, Colorado and, you know, in my career, and I know Chief Prazen's career, I've always been committed to crime prevention and things that we can do to keep people out of the criminal justice system. We've always been about that when it came to things like drug court, when it came to juvenile diversion, early childhood development. All those things are extremely important when you're talking about trying to prevent the causes of crime. But the three-year-olds and five-year-olds that need early childhood development right now are not committing the auto thefts that we're seeing. So I think, you know, you've got to be committed to all of those prevention type things, but you also have to realize that in Colorado, there is an awful lot of our criminal population that is out on the streets. And when they're out on the streets, even under supervision, Many of these people are under supervision of probation, parole, bond. They're committing crimes. And it's a very small group. And we saw that in some of the other studies that we did. But if you know where they are, you're supervising them, then you, know, you can control some of their behavior. Uh, thank you for that, Mitch. And, and we're going to flesh those out as well. But what you're saying here, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, that there's a correlation as an association, perhaps even a causation, with low-level property crimes, with the more violent crimes. Is that what is that? Am I hearing you right, sir? Yes, and that's uh, proven out by the data from New York State. The other thing I'll tell you is that I mean, the good news is that this is a relatively small group. When we started using DNA to catch burglars. Uh, the, with the Denver Police Department, the Denver Crime Lab, we did a study with the National Institute of Justice. This is back in 2014, 2012. And what we found was that if we caught people with fingerprints or burglar, burglars with fingerprints or DNA, and if we held them to account because they were professional burglars, that's what they did. An average professional burglar will commit 100 burglaries in your community a year. So if you focus on someone that is that criminally active and you hold them account, you make them plead guilty to the charge that they're charged with, and many of them have multiple offenses. But we're talking about in four years, about 400 cases, not a lot of cases. We reduced the burglary rate in the metropolitan area by 40% by taking those active um, professionals off the street. And you know, they weren't off the street all that long because of the rules in Colorado. They got an average sentence of about 11 years, which really is about three years when you're talking about burglary. So they weren't gone that long. They were under super, but there were hundreds and hundreds of burglaries that did not occur because we focused on those habitual criminals. Thank you for that. Uh, Lisa Ravel, from your perspective, I guess the same question. What are you seeing on the ground? You're on the ground, your organization is on the ground, um, very actively helping out folks. Uh, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? What are the anecdotes that you're that you're um, filtering from the community in terms of what you think is driving these numbers? Well, I, I have to agree with the rest of the panel where we want to talk about prevention and we want to talk about re-engagement. If we're, if we're talking about recidivism for folks, it's setting people up successfully too. Um, when people have felonies, they have difficulty accessing housing and uh, employment, um, which puts them at higher risk of recidivism. So I, I look forward to this the conversation of talking about, you know, the folks that are working with folks that not only come out of Department of Corrections, where we spend a billion dollars every year for Department of Corrections and have a very high recidivism rate, but also engaging with those folks that are in and out of county jail, uh, on probation, those on parole, um, but the intensive case management of, you know, investing in people and investing in communities. Um, so, you know, my folks ebb and flow, as you can imagine, but oftentimes it's very difficult to obtain housing in Denver if you have a felony within seven years, violent or not. And so, you know, we housing insecurity tends to be 
a very big issue for our folks and you know housing can be substance use treatment so I look forward to kind of you know transitioning the conversation there Luigi. Well let, let's transition the conversation to there let's talk about those things that you mentioned um here's what I'm hearing uh, I'm hearing what I'm hearing from from the panelists is this crime, of course, is a multivariant analysis. Like there are multiple layers of reasons why people could be committing crime. You, you mentioned housing, the lack of housing, the difficulty of getting all these programs. Um, so let's talk about what would you like the state do, specifically on the population that Mitch Morris is talking about, the repeat offender population. There. Uh, there's a tendency to just go out and offend and reoffend, and of course, and Mitch, correct me if I'm wrong. From your point of view, the way you deal with this population is you take them out of society, if you will. You isolate them. You have them plead guilty to, uh, you know, whatever crimes they committed, and kind of uh, keep them for as long as possible. Uh, but Lisa, let me get your thoughts. Well, you know. At some point, a lot of people are transitioning out of incarceration. So I think that the focus should be on those programs that are investing in the safety of the community and the safety of the individual, such as like a second chance center, right? They work with folks coming out of Department of Corrections in Aurora. They also have a second chance center in the city in Denver and giving that intensive case management and also we're trying to reduce recidivism, right? And everybody needs somebody pushing forward for healthier and safer them today. So I can understand, you know, this, you know, a lot of people want folks incarcerated, but we're not really seeing rehabilitation happening for those that are incarcerated either. You know, when people were having, were in Department of Corrections for uh, possession of drugs, there was less than six months and you weren't even getting any substance use treatment. Then people are transitioned back out and we see even, you know, a large percentage of women who come back out are caregivers, which are then aren't able to focus on the recovery. So I think, you know, we, we have, you know, the, it's the easy kind of talk about to pop people in, what is happening while they're in there? And then what are we doing to reduce recidivism once they leave? What I'm hearing, and correct me if I'm wrong, Lisa, what you're saying here, Miam, is that there's a failure on the part of the state and failure, I know I'm using that word very carefully. There's a failure on the part of the state to offer uh, offenders, repeat offenders, a chance to get out of the cycle that they're in. Is that is that what you're saying? Well, I'm not sure a failure, but I think that's something that we're here on a panel to talk about. Right? What are the challenges and opportunities? We, we are, we're not arresting our way out of it right now. So what, what, does, what does success look like? And what does a healthier and safer community look like for everybody? Uh, and that's Dr. engaging in public safety. And we've got, Pass got no problem ahead, with people. We've got no problem with people taking advantage of those programs and succeeding in those programs. You know, I, I've been on the board of the Haven and the Baby Haven, which is drug treatment program for women, women with young babies for years supported the Haven forever because the Haven works. What we're talking about is the person that has gotten the benefit of, of these things, gotten, and you know we find their fingerprints in a burglary. Uh, Chief pays and pulls them, one of their officers pulls them over in a stolen car. I mean, these are people that are not taking advantage of the things that the state is offering and they're committing crimes. And they're committing a lot more crimes than they're getting caught for. I, I don't think there is a police agency in the metropolitan area that is not down personnel, that isn't short officers, that is recruiting like crazy. I don't know the benefits that, that Chief Pazin is offering recruits that are trying to, you know, he's trying to get into the police department, but we are in an era now, or, or and hopefully a short one, where you know, policing is not is not considered a a good profession. Unfortunately, we well, have a state that holds police officers ci uh, civilly liable personally, which is one of the only states that does that. So you have that factor working in the state of Colorado. You have a lot of career criminals on the streets that are raising these crime rates, and we don't have the manpower, the women power, the police power to, to, to go after them. So we're in this very kind of strange, and we've been in situations like this before where there were incredible budget cuts. And you know, I lived through that in Denver. I lived through that with when Bill Ritter was the governor and he was just trying to figure out who could he get out of the penitentiary to save money, those kinds of things. But you know, you have to 
You have to see what's causing this. You have to study it and you have to make you have to make positive steps that way. But we're certainly not thinking that, you know, you don't op offer these opportunities that are so important to get these people out of the system. If they're juveniles, if they're drug addicts, no matter what the situation is, you've got to offer them those opportunities because if they do get out, they don't, they don't reoffend. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's what we all want. Um, and I'm going to go to Dr. Pasco here in, in a second, but I want to I want to ask uh, Chief Payson first, sir. Uh, your lamentation that there are policies that are coming out of the state legislature that, and I'm putting words into your mouth, so correct me if uh, if, <laughs> if you know if I'm wrong. Uh, the, the policies that are coming out of the state legislature are perhaps making your job difficult. In fact, uh, as the Colorado Politics uh, reported a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Colorado Association of Chiefs of Police, the Colorado, Colorado Fraternal Order of Police and the County Sheriffs of Colorado, decried what they describe as an anti-law anti enforcement sentiment uh, permeating policy discussions at the state capitol that they said create a climate that discourages law enforcers, law enforcers and hinders recruitment and retention efforts, for example. And let me ask you specifically, what is your experience in terms of enforcing policies out of the legislature that you think haven't helped your uh, haven't helped you and other law enforcement do your job? So uh, again, this is a compounding issue. We could talk about uh, House Bill 141266. We could talk about House Bill uh, 191263. We could talk about Senate Bill uh, 21271. Uh, there are a layering uh, effect of, of the bills that has certainly made it more difficult for us in the state of Colorado to keep our community safe. Historically, Colorado has been well below the national average in crime rates, whether that's violent crime to include homicide rates or property crimes. And I think this is most outlined in uh, auto thefts. Historically, uh, we've been very safe. The most recent report or most recent data, uh, not from the Denver Police Department, but from the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, looking at the entire state, shows these dramatic increases and shows that we actually exceed the national average when uh, historically we've been very safe. Uh, if we are talking about FBI data uh, from 2019 to 2020, the, the, the national data that exists, uh, crime in the entire country on average went down 6.2%. In Colorado, uh, only three states did it worse than us. In Colorado, our crime rate went up more than 8%. Again, these numbers are very alarming. To move a statewide number on violent crime by 17%, murder by 47%, that is alarming. Luigi, you did point to, to one spot of good news, the reduction in sex assault cases. Well, from uh, my perspective and, and what we saw here in Denver is that's probably draw, driven more by environmental factors, meaning bars, nightclubs were closed for a good portion of that two year time period. So I uh, certainly don't wanna celebrate a reduction in that one crime category when the vast ma majority of the crime categories are going up and they're going up at a significant rate. Uh, we also talked about recidivism uh, here. Uh, again, Colorado ranks at the bottom of the list. Uh, there's only three states in the entire country that do it worse than we do. So when we're talking about we should analyze the impacts of legislative initiatives, we should also analyze uh, what's going on with recidivism. And the fact that we have not uh, put people on a plane and sent them to states that have half of our recidivism rate and start asking these questions of how are you doing it? How are you helping people? Because ultimately our goals are 100% aligned. Every single person on this screen wants the same thing. We do want safer uh, communities and we want to do that in a responsible way. I, I know I spent a lot of time talking, but let me also point out the fact and, and, and kind of piggyback on what Mitch has said. Uh, our police department here in Denver is one of the most progressive uh, police departments there is anywhere in the country, right? We did uh, law enforcement assisted diversion, uh, early adopters of that practice. Uh, our co-responder program is as robust 
as there is anywhere in the country. We were the first major police department, major city uh, in the country to implement the STAR program. We also have the outreach case coordinators that do the follow-up work uh, when people are in crisis. So that way we can create long-term sust sustainable approaches to keep them from crisis. And now we are working on, again, a real solution called the Assessment Intake Diversion Center that can help uh, folks when uh, they are committing low-level crimes get connected to case managers, uh, substance use navigators, to housing assistants, uh, but still hold accountable individuals that are part of retail theft rings or repeat uh, offenders. So there is a way to, to do this. And, and we as a, a city and the state of Colorado, um, there, there are many law enforcement agencies across the entire state that have adopted co-responder programs or alternative response or case managers in order to uh, help. Yet, um, any, you know, all the, the star bands, uh, if we had a thousand star bands in, in Denver, that's not going to reduce the dramatic increases that we've had in shootings, in homicides, in robberies, in burglaries, or auto thefts. And so we have to take a balanced approach of firm compassion in order to, one, uh, keep our community safe, but also hold accountable the individuals that are doing the repeat and violent offenses. Thank you, thank you, Chief Payson. I want to bring in Dr. Pasco. Ma'am, uh, when we had a prep call a couple of days ago, you said that um, there, could, there are solutions to these issues. There are potential of uh, a framework that we can look at these problems and tackle them and find a way out, if that's at all possible, find a way out. What to you, uh, when, when you've heard the chief, uh, uh, when you, you will hear uh, Mr. Morrissey when you hear Lisa Ravel describe these problems. What what can what's your mind? Can the state do at this moment to reduce crime? Honestly, Luigi, if I had a definitive two minute answer to that, I would not be a college professor. I would be very <laughs> wealthy, and I would be a consultant in every state selling my program. That being said, um, I, I, just a few things that I, I want to respond to from what I've been hearing, and. I, I do think that there's a problem in treating everyone that's on um, pretrial release as if they're all going to be or all career criminals. That we know from our research on those that have been uh, released over like the last decade, there's been research on that in Colorado. And not it's not a huge percentage that our violent offenders are going to violent offense. I'm not saying that we shouldn't capture those that are career criminals and, and you know potentially creating um, victimization, whether it's property or violent, but we shouldn't just sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater either. Um, and I think that when we talk about how everybody on this panel and everyone that's part of this wants a safer society, I think we also want a fair and effective criminal justice system. And those concepts are not diametrically opposed, but they do need to be data-based and they need to be evidence-driven. Um, as far as the solutions, we've been at this point before, you know, I don't know if all of us here have been at this exact point before, but, you know, we've been at this point where we saw crime rates go up and particularly violent crime rates go up, even though at a last moment it kind of crept up more than it did in um, 2020 um, and see that big spike. And some of the solutions, you know, at that moment in time, we tried to incarcerate, incarcerate our way out of this problem. And while it feels good to do this kind of law and order approach because it's definitive and it's immediate, we haven't gotten our bang for our buck on that. It was a very expensive project that broke up families and communities. And we just haven't been able with the research to show that really it worked in order to bring down crime rates. In fact, when we started becoming more punitive in the early eighties, we actually didn't see crime drop into the mid nineties. So I just want to make a cautionary point where, you know, one of the things that is why jail sometimes does work in this way is that we're providing some sort of stability and security and housing. Like housing is the biggest thing that I see. If we want to look at the New York City example, not only was it changes to policing, but we really didn't see the effect coming off a of stop and frisk. And there's a lot of us that don't like the broken windows approach either, because that just shifts crime and concentrates at other places. But what we really saw was we, we saw more effective policing, larger numbers of police. It is very concerning the state, the number of separations that have been happening since 2017, that is very concerning. 
And so we know when we have more police and we do strategies like Chief just talked about, especially with hotspot policing and problem-oriented policing, bringing in, I mean, I know we don't like to hear the word accountability, but accountability measures actually do make police officers and the community safer, that when we bring these different strategies and the number of police in and increase the number of police, we actually increase that sort of suitable guardianship in communities and it makes us safer. It really does. Um, and so, you know, that is one thing that we learned from our Denver's example, but also our folks in San Diego, our folks in New York City, they had those models too. But, but the other thing that made New York City a safer city wasn't really just doing the massive sweeps, which clogged up the lower courts and people were in and out of jail very frequently. It's that people were able to kind of drive activities indoors. We have a huge housing crisis here in Denver and we do not have a living wage to match the housing crisis. It's not just the number uh, that were down, which I mean, I can even refer to Mitch's report on that, where I mean, we're thousands and thousands of affordable housing short. And that's just affordable housing. If you can afford nothing, you have nowhere to go. During the pandemic, I just, I also just want to bring this up too, is that everything shut down. It wasn't just that we released people out of jail and that we decreased supervision to 20% that where were you gonna go? There were no shelter beds open and all these great prevention programs and starting in 2020, there was a year long wait list to get into them. So even though the Haven program that Mitch was talking about, I actually really like, I also know it can be really limited beds and very little opportunity if that's what you're so choosing to do. And I agree, like so cho choosing to do such that. We have limited beds with sober living, limited beds with residential treatment. So our options, aren't that great when it comes to kind of providing the resources and the opportunities for those that don't wanna be on the streets. And we do know that homelessness is such a crime adjacent condition that we're gonna engage in survival strategies. And some of those are going to be, those survival strategies are going to end up being criminal. This is why it's a big predictor and a big pathway factor to committing more serious crime. And so when we really address that in Denver and we have to, we have to, acknowledge that that's been a chronic problem starting in about 2013, 2012. And, you know, we're, we're starting to dig our way out of it. There are some good news with that. I can actually pivot to Lisa to um, discuss some opportunities that she has seen her clients use recently that have actually reduced criminality as well as Lisa, you mentioned um, reduction in, in drug use too, once they find a stable housing environment. And once we reduce, you know, the drug use, once we reduce the criminal survival strategies, we're going to see a drop in aggravated assault as well, because we saw that kind of increase at the same time. And I also, when, I, when we're talking about motor vehicle theft, we have to acknowledge how many narcotics related MVTs there are out there. And when we look at what's really happening with um, narcotics and motor vehicle field theft, we see a lot of it. Isn't it about 60% of it is meth related? And we see these cars, the recovery on our vehicles in Colorado is much higher than the national average. We're returning huge percentages within 30 days. And so a lot of these, even we see this from our arrests are people living in these cars. And when we see a meth related charge with them, they're using meth to stay warm and they're using cars to live in. This is the reality of the situation. That is not a, a, whole, a solution to housing insecurity that's related to crime rates. It's just not. And just the last thing, um, you know, maybe this is good news, bad news, but during the pandemic, we did see housing insecurity and uh, housing insecurity go up about 100%. We saw first time homelessness go up about the same rate. So we really are talking about underneath this crime problem isn't necessarily a response to crime problem. It's the predictors and the pathways to crime problem that was highly amplified in the last couple of years. What, what I'm hearing, ma'am, is that uh, there are these conditions that are set up the uh, the spike in crime that we're, we're seeing in Colorado, the homelessness that you mentioned, of course, when you talk about homelessness, it sets a, it's a Herculean task to tackle. It, it, it's it's multi-level, it takes a lot of money to solve it. But you mentioned some interventions that have worked and you, you mentioned Lisa, Lisa Lisa's program and her organization has done a, a tre tremendous job in this arena. Lisa, why don't you describe for us just really quickly, what are the things that you're seeing that actually work in your experience in uh, reducing crime and getting people out of that cycle. Sure, so, and I think what Dr. Pasco is speaking to is the social impact bond housing, uh, which incarcerates or uh, houses our most incarcerated folks for low level offenses, um, which we've actually seen as reduced meth use. 
So I do know a lot of my folks who are unhoused use meth in the winter uh, on especially a cold night that don't wanna go into the shelters that walk around the city and not lay down and freeze to death. So we have found that for stimulant users in particular, housing can be substance use treatment because what we don't have in the state of Colorado is much substance use treatment for stimulant users, that's cocaine, crack, and meth. Um, and you know, they, inpatient continues to be a story of hope for so many folks. And if they do access inpatient, oftentimes they're discharged unhoused um, so the cycle kind of continues. So where we've really seen a lot of great um, uh, use is, well, reduction of use is with the housing, with the social impact bond housing that's happening in Denver. I don't believe that's happening in the rest of the state, but we are encouraging that as well. Um, uh, let me ask uh, Mitch. Mitch, what I heard from uh, Dr. Pasco is that there are these conditions that have led to the spike in crime, among them homelessness, uh, the lack of intervention programs, maybe a reduction in the police force, or maybe not having enough police officers on the street. All those create, at the very least, a, you know, a, a, a sense of a safer environment, safer streets, if you will. But let me specifically ask you about uh, law enforcement's uh, call to the state legislature to unwind a law that they passed in 2019. This is a law that lowered the penalty for possession of uh, uh, certain drugs. And uh, you know the law enforcement community is saying this is a problem. But explain to us how this is a problem, and what would you like? What else would you like to see the legislature do in this arena? Well, I think you're referring to um, possession offenses that were reduced to misdemeanors. Remember. I haven't been the district attorney now for, <laughs> for about five years. So, you know, and, and my role is to currently try to solve old rapes and murders across the country. And so I don't keep up with the legislature. And I got to tell you, I actually found dealing with the legislature to be one of the most unpleasant parts <laughs> of my job when I was working for the district attorney's office. I lived through a lot of the things that are, are being talked about um, here as a young prosecutor, when crack cocaine took a generation of Denver and basically parents and wiped them out, left us with an incredible number of, of homeless, I, I mean, of kids that were being raised by grandkids and aunties. And, you know, th that just didn't really work. And, and I, I have seen Denver respond to you know, what happened then with the gangs that just those kids that joined gangs and things. And I saw Denver respond to that. And actually during the time I was district attorney, I had the benefit of an awful lot of hard work, both the nonprofits that we talk about, you know, the programs that we're describing and, and the crime rate was, I mean, the homicide rate was, you had to go back to the eighties beyond the 80s to find a homicide rate as low as we had while I was in the district attorney's office. But, you know, this is a crop, this is a call out to the community, you know, and homelessness is a big issue. And I have to tell Dr. Pasco, I was not involved in the, um, the homeless report that, uh, the common sense Institute wrote. I was only a fellow for the crime Institute, but, I mean, for the crime study, but I can tell you that to have an organization like that stepping up and addressing these kinds of issues and saying, you know, the cost of this increase in crime in Colorado is $27 billion. That is, if you compare it to our state annual budget, 77%, that's, you know, it's, 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 it's very close. It's 35 billion and 27 billion. That's a lot of money for the people of the state of Colorado to pay for. We've talked about a lot of expensive programs. And usually what I found is that those programs that we're describing are actually less expensive than incarcerating somebody, but you can't step away from the fact that there is a core group of criminals that live in our community. And thank God it's a small number. You may need to incarcerate them once you have provided them with all of the opportunities that Dr. Pasco has talked about, that Lisa has talked about, 
you got to have those programs. They got to be there. They've got to be well funded. They've got to be supported. But there's a group out there that'll just say, you know, I'm a criminal. My father was a criminal. My grandfather was a criminal. And I bet you the chief can give you some of those names of those generational families. They're crooks and they're going to be crooks. And they're five, 10 time convicted felons that have been through probation, that have been given all these opportunity. I don't know how many times, and they are driving this crime rate up. And those are the people we need to focus on. And the legislature seems to separate not separate out that, that, that number of people. And when they talk about things going on in the legislature that are offender you know, friendly, you, you have to face it, there are. I mean, just this week, our felon with a gun statute got watered down more. Now you can be a felon with a gun depending on what felony it is. Everybody is concerned about this violent crime rate. Everybody is concerned about people shooting each other with guns, but yet the legislature reduces what was already one of the weakest felon with a gun statutes in the United States and makes it weaker. So it, it's kind of like, yeah, we're concerned about gun proliferation. We're concerned about, you know, we're the state of Columbine. We're the state of the Aurora theater shooting. We're gonna jump all over guns. And then you reduce the laws that have to do with guns uh, in your state, it makes no sense to me. And it's very hard for me to understand why you can't strengthen that, that law and you know, actually take care of some of these habitual criminals that are out there walking around with guns on our street. And I think if you ask Chief Pazin, most of them are being supervised by the court system or the prison system, and they are killing people. And he has those numbers. And I think we need to talk about that. But these solutions are great to have and we need them. And I'm a strong supporter of them. But there's that group of people that you need to deal with in a different way. Uh, thank you for that, Mitch. And to our audience and to our listeners, again, thank you for staying with us. Uh, we do want to spend uh, uh, maybe five, seven minutes uh, toward the end of the program answering your questions. So if you want to send your questions uh, via, via the Q&A box or the chat box, please go ahead and do so. Uh, Chief Payson, sir, um, I want to ask you some, a, a practical question. Uh, what should I do as a resident of Denver, maybe just a, a resident of, of the county, a resident of the state? What, what can I do right now to help me keep myself, my family, my kids safe? What, can, what steps can residents take at this point to keep themselves safe? Luigi, uh, thank you. Uh, great question. Uh, so uh, real easy, it's uh, getting involved, right? Uh, engaged communities are strong communities and strong communities are safe communities. Uh, there are uh, aspects of, of the uh, uh, social, pro-social supports that help people maintain uh, safety. So uh, now is the time that we all get involved. Now is the time that we all uh, at least acknowledge that we have a problem. And I think that that's been part of the issue is people are trying to sweep this under the rug and say, oh no, uh, crime's not that bad in Colorado. There's only three states doing it worse than, than us. Uh, recidivism, not that bad. There's only three states doing it worse than we are. Uh, 2021 had the most homicide victims in Colorado going back that 35 years, going back to 1985. Our previous high was way back in 1986 when we had 231. Uh, last year, we had 357. Uh, we used to be half of the national average or about half the national average with homicide rate. We can't say that anymore. So we have serious issues that we need to come together, acknowledge that we have a problem, and then start working on solutions. It's not just one solution. It is uh, identifying what's working and what's not working. And unfortunately, we don't seem to uh, look back. We don't seem to take analysis of, of what has occurred in try to identify what some of the uh, factors are that are contributing to these issues. Um, homelessness is uh, a problem, but 
Homelessness is not the reason why we had 357 murders in the state of Colorado, the all time high in the last 35 years. Auto theft, maybe some of the, the, the cars are stolen are being uh, used by individuals experiencing homelessness, but that's not my experience. My experience is these stolen cars are used for shootings, robberies, burglaries, larcenies, and uh, too many times uh, they're involved in hit and run serious bodily injury or uh, fatalities. We just had one two weeks ago where a uh, member uh, was killed in downtown Denver and it was just a stolen car. And I have too many examples uh, of, of that occurring. So uh, what my hope uh, that, that all of us on this panel, all of us are listening, that we can acknowledge that we have uh, an issue, that we have a problem, a statewide problem. This is not Denver exclusive. It's not the Denver metro area. This is across the state of Colorado. And we come together to start figuring out some solutions. But the community is the biggest part of that. The community awareness, the community engagement, uh, the strong communities create safer communities. And that's my hope. Thank, thank you for that. I want to go into some of the uh, questions from the viewers and the listeners here. Uh, many of the questions have to do with fentanyl. As you know, fentanyl is fueling uh, a real crisis. Five people in Commerce City died recently, believed to have been caused by uh, you know, by fentanyl. Uh, Dr. Pasco, ma'am, you're a sociologist, criminologist. Um, it's a heartbreaking situation. How, any, any ideas, any framework that we can use to specifically tackle the fentanyl issue from your point of view? Oh, Lisa, you raise your hand. Go ahead, ma'am. I want to pivot to, to um, Lisa, the other Lisa on this one, um, who would be more the expert on yep. fentanyl. Yep, go ahead, Lisa. I appreciate that. We, I think we can all agree we are in the midst of the worst overdose crisis we've ever been in. Um, where we often disagree is we believe this is a public health emergency that demands a public health approach and not continued criminalization. Fentanyl has been in the United States since 2014 on the East Coast, in Colorado since 2018. It's kind of nuanced and twofold, right? Uh, we have, it, it, it's in all drugs as we saw in Adams County, it's in heroin and meth, and then it's also in pressed pills, right? That has a little fentanyl, a lot of fentanyl or no fentanyl. Um, we are actually, uh, heroin's kind of uh, hugging and releasing its way out of here uh, because of climate change. There's lack of poppy cultivation, meaning there's lack of farmers and farmland. And so what they're actually doing is shifting to synthetic opioids, which are made in labs. So the drug market has brought us fentanyl. Um, fentanyl will be here for a little bit before the new synthetic opioid comes from the East Coast too. So there's concern, especially among you know, my folks who are opioid users who use fentanyl um, than the smoke the pills because they're glad that they're not injecting anymore either. It's actually more difficult to induct on medication assisted treatment if they use fentanyl too. So what we wanna be doing is having these larger, more robust conversations that we don't believe that doubling down on criminalization for people who use drugs uh, to go into uh, prison, jail and prison is the answer. We need to be shifting, much like we had a bipartisan conversation and a bipartisan vote in 2019 about drug use. You know, law enforcement knows they can't arrest their way out of drug use, or they've done this years and years and years ago. So we do need to be shifting more to public health. So there are a lot of nuances, again, that are happening with uh, fentanyl, but we've also had an increase in overdose deaths over the last 50 years in the United States and over the last 20 years in particular. So COVID was not the reason for that either. Thank you for that, Lisa. And Mitch, just really quickly on fentanyl, sir, your thoughts, how do we tackle this one? And just really quickly, so we can get to some more questions here. I never saw a fentanyl case. I mean, again, that's, I've been out of this business for a while as far as fentanyl is concerned. Um, and, and there's a balance there. I, I agree it's a public health issue. I agree that narcotics addiction is a public health issue, but it is also against the law. And so I think, Luigi, I think I didn't mean to not answer your last question, but I get a chance to, to do that here. And that is that the reason law enforcement would be concerned about lessening and lessening the amount, you know, the, the penalty for these kinds of crimes is you don't have any, I mean, addiction is a horrible thing. It's very hard to get over it. And if you have something hanging over someone's head, um, you know, in drug court, we always had that you're going to get kicked out of drug court. And we would give people 20, 30, whatever chances 
to avoid that happening. But that idea helped them stay in, helped them stay sober. The, the, I know, for instance, the Haven that we've talked about, most of those women are coming out of the Department of Corrections. The downside of failing there is going back to the Department of Corrections where they don't belong. But, you know, it's kind of like that's the, that's the hammer that helps sometimes. And, you know, the Haven has a great success rate. And you listen to those addicted, formerly addicted women saying, you know, if it wasn't for this place, if it wasn't for the, the fact that I saw what the penitentiary was like, I never would be clean and sober. I never would be a good mother to my children. Thank so you, it's a weird balance. Well, um, here's a, a question. Perhaps Chief Payson can answer this one. Would better securing the border help the flow of drugs into the country? And to what extent would it? So uh, I'm not going to answer uh, that question. That's a, a far uh, above my pay grade. Uh, you know, we do not have. Uh, we'll any... need another Colorado conversations for that. Just a one hour conversation about it at some point. But go ahead, yes. sir. Yes. No. Uh, you know, again, I have I have no control over that, and so uh, I'm going to avoid any comment on on that particular issue. Uh, another question, and again, this is to Chief Payson. Uh, you know, what can you do uh, to help recruit? I, I guess the, the the question is the right kind of people to help you get into the 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 you know get into the the law enforcement force, uh, and then of course retain them. Uh, Luigi, uh, this is an excellent question. So whoever asked this, I'm very thankful for it. Um, and, and you kind of uh, touched on it a little bit earlier, right? We had uh, leaders uh, in the state. Uh, we had uh, elected leaders in the city that uh, a couple, almost two years ago, were uh, saying defund the police. They were saying abolish the police. Uh, they were saying decenter the police. Uh, law enforcement has never been as difficult as it is today, but it's also never been as important as it is today. So if we want to have better policing, and I know that uh, in my heart, that is what survey after survey after survey, national surveys, local surveys say, they want better policing, that we need leadership from uh, elected officials to stand up and say, be the change that you want to see. This is a noble profession. You can have a positive impact on people's lives every single day. And to change that narrative that uh, was being uh, spoken about defund, abolish, decenter, and let's get people with big hearts who care about their community, that want to make a, a difference, that want to be the change that people want to see. That's how we can get uh, more people interested in this field. If we had uh, elected leaders at the highest level uh, say encouraging uh, marginalized communities, communities of color to take a look at this noble profession so they could help their own neighborhoods out, I think that that would go a long way. And all I hear is, is silence, uh, particularly from the, the folks that used to say uh, decenter, abolish, and defund. Thank you, Chief Pazin. I want to go to Lisa Rayville. Ma'am, you got this backdrop that says Carrie Naloxone, uh, Kelly Nark Narkhan. Just really quickly, how important is it for people like me, for example, to in fact carry naloxone? If you walk on earth right now, I need you carrying naloxone or Narcan. It's safe and highly effective. Paramedics and emergency departments have been using it for over 40 years, which is really great if overdoses happen around paramedics or emergency departments. It needs to be in the hands of people who use drugs first and foremost, and then third parties. Anybody in the state since 2013 can carry naloxone and it limited civil and criminal liability. You can walk into any pharmacy today in the state of Colorado and get access to it virtually over the counter. It's still a prescription drug and most major insurances cover it. And 204 law enforcement departments in the state carry Narcan. DPD was first, Colorado Springs PD was second. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. We need an all hands on deck approach in the worst overdose crisis we've ever been in. And, and also, just, and you know, we, I want to piggyback back a little bit to Lisa's Lisa. Lisa, really quickly, yes, ma'am. Yeah, just, well, just to add to Lisa's about a harm reduction approach, you can get fentanyl testing strips that are fairly inexpensive. So there should be a public health messaging. You know, fentanyl um, is laced a lot of times with something that's more powder-like um, and maybe wouldn't be expected in a stimulant such as cocaine in the tragic situation that we saw happen in Commerce City. But even just having these fentanyl strips, which you can buy on Amazon, 
for like a dollar a strip. If you are a, a using drugs, this is a way to make sure that you know what you are using and that it is not gonna be so potent that it is going to kill you. Okay. So that is also a harm reduction approach that we have seen actually be pretty effective. Uh, Sorry, I Lisa, be... if I stole your thunder on that one. Oh, oh thank great you. Great job, thanks. Mitch, Mitch <laughs> just really quickly because we're out of time. Yes, well, sir, I just had one thing, you know, I've been carrying, unfortunately, I carry a tourniquet that uh, the police foundation was raising money and selling. I carry that because I saw how when people are shot, when they are suffering injuries that are going to kill them, when I started the DA's office, they wouldn't make it to Denver Health alive. But uh, I have that tourniquet in my car. I haven't had to use it, thank goodness. But, um, you know, I've seen it save lives. You slap that on and people, they stop, they stop bleeding out. And, you know, unfortunately, the violence that we're seeing in Denver it could be a possibility that you witness something like that and you could make a difference. And, and with that, I wanna thank Dr. Pascoe. Thank you for your time, ma'am. Mitch Morrissey, thank you for your time. Lisa Ravel, thank you. Ma'am, uh, Chief Payson, thank you for your time, sir. I know you're very busy and being very gracious to our viewers and to our listeners. Thank you for your time. Thank you for spending the morning with us. Again, I wanna thank the Colorado Politics and the Denver Gazette for hosting this program. This won't be the last one. And uh, with that, I wanna say, Enjoy the rest of your day and I'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.